The day I was going to make parole, um, a guy that I was on the zone with had a life sentence. He was an African-American from Waynesboro, Mississippi. And he grabs my arm and he calls me over to his rack and we go over there and he just looks at me and he says, don't forget about us. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, don't forget about us. He said, you don't look like us. You don't talk like us. People will listen to you because you don't look like us. So you need to be our voice. Like most, I was just going through life, searching for purpose. I always felt like there was something more. Could never find it and had the career, had the, the money, the house, the family, everything that the world said that mattered most. And I just knew that there was something missing. And uh, unfortunately, I started using recreational pain pills and uh, that ultimately led to a um, heroin addiction uh, that I went to detox for. And at that time, I lost my family, lost my son. And so I came out of detox and just began using heroin even uh, more severe. And about two years later, March 8th of 2013, I was homeless on the streets in Connecticut and attempted to take my own life. And uh, fortunately, God had a different plan um, my parents found out here in Brandon, Mississippi, where I'm originally from. So I moved back to Mississippi, and unfortunately, 1,300 miles didn't change anything except the drug of choice. And uh, so I started using methamphetamines. Within a 16-month period of using methamphetamines, I amassed six felonies in three counties and got sentenced to serve 20 years in MDOC custody. It was my time in Simpson County when my life changed forever. That's whenever a jail minister came in. And uh, just being present in that moment, I told God, if you're real, then I'll give you everything I got, which was nothing. I knew I was going to prison. I knew that I had nothing to offer. And uh, God began to change my life. Um, the first two years I was in prison, I struggled with relapse. Um, you know, it's kind of like sending somebody on a diet to a buffet. Um, you know, the prison system has filtrated with drugs. And uh, so I struggled for that. My heart was different, but I still just couldn't overcome it. And then finally, February 23rd of 2017, um, God took my addiction away where I lost all the tastes and desires and uh, just the want to. And uh, since that time, uh, God put on my heart to help and encourage brothers and sisters that are going through the same things that I have in life, whether it be incarceration or addiction, and just to kind of show them that there is a different way and that we don't have to be bound by our past and we can answer to a new name and that we no longer have to identify with addict or convict, that there's truly a different way and a new beginning if you're willing to uh, sacrifice and allow God to transform your life. I was able to truly get a fresh start coming out of the prison system, so I paroled out to Lowndes County, um, joined a church here in Columbus, Mississippi called Vibrant. We uh, led a serve team called Grow Track, which was all new members at the church. And uh, just so happened that Miss Jean uh, Moore, the program director here, felt in her heart she had just taken the position, and so she took the three men in the program to the same church, and she chose to serve on that team. And we were talking and just getting to know each other, and I was just very free-flowing with my story and just kind of sharing. And so she started just crying, and she said, I've been praying that God would send me somebody to lead these men. The mission is a 12-month program, but we are set up in four phases. Uh, first phase of the program is uh, all classrooms. Uh, I teach, uh, teach an anger management class. It's a cognitive behavior therapy, uh, just understanding to recognize your emotions before you snap and get into trouble or do something that you would regret. Uh, we do a Life Healing Choices, which is by Pastor Rick Warren, and so we do celebrate recovery step study. Uh, for the addiction aspect. Um, we do start every day off with a Bible study, uh, and then we do classes for the phase one of the programs, and then there's a night class. Um, after first 90 days, if the individual completes all of their coursework, then I do job placement using skills that they have. However, if that skill triggers past behavior, then we partner with the EMCC uh, to do uh, some six-week certifications for welding. Uh, there's a lot of steel companies here that will hire them immediately. And we also have employers here that will give on-the-job training. Uh, once they go to work, then they're responsible to pay program fees. Uh, we believe that that should be on the individual and not on the family. Most of our men here have burned every bridge that they've had. So we don't want to put a financial burden on the family or that individual to come up with the money in an unproductive way. So they pay once we fulfill our obligation of placing them in a job. 
They're also required to save 80% of their money while they're here. So they get 20% spending money for the week, and then the other 80% is saved. They can only use it for fines or restitution, anything else. They have to just save it in an account. And that gives them the ability to truly get a fresh start when they complete our program. We believe that without job stability and financial stability, that even if you have sobriety and mental stability, that you will eventually, that will go away if you don't have financial and job stability. When I started working here in February of 21, we had four men in the program and uh, myself and Miss Jean. Uh, today we have 21 men in the program. Just for them to be able to transition out and be able to do it slowly in a structured, organized way instead of just having them a bus ticket and say, figure it out, they're incapable of that. That's, not, that's, that's setting them up for failure. We as a staff feel like everybody deserves a second chance. We believe that this is where second chances happen, but the reality is, is for most of us, you're really on your 12th chance or 13th chance. But at the end of the day, if we're not willing to give these men a chance, who is? It's not about your, what you did yesterday. It's just about moment by moment, how am I living today? We need the community to love on these dudes and let them know that they are loved, that they have value, and that they're not forgotten. It does not matter to me if they come out of prison. It doesn't matter to us if they come out of jail what their charge is for the most part. The only th charge that we're not able to deal with there is sex offenders. But outside of that, it doesn't matter to us because what happened in the past is not who they are today. That we believe that God can transform any lives. So I feel that we will continue to be a avenue of resource for people that have committed violent crimes, that nonviolent crimes, people that haven't committed crimes, to be able to work with the local sheriff's department and the judges and the courts here to be an alternative to prison and not a, a release from prison. Because if we could provide these resources before they go to prison, maybe we can prevent the prison population. If we could provide these resources instead of them sitting in the county jails for the year, year and a half it takes for them to be indicted and to go before the judge, I feel very confident that if a judge saw that an individual, instead of sitting in a jail cell for a year and a half, chose to come to a program to rehabilitate and to allow God to restore them, I, I dare say that that judge would have some leniency and see that that individual was truly sorry for their mistakes and give them a second chance. There are barriers and obstacles and limitations that people face. And I think that it's important for us to understand that everyone is unique, their circumstances. And to not give people a second and third chance means that you are bounding them for a lifetime for a poor decision or a bad act of judgment. So I understand that there's a difference in sins, but at the same day, if we all want grace for ourselves, then we should be willing to extend grace to others in a healthy way within boundaries. I'm not saying I, I committed my crimes. I'm not saying that I should not have been sentenced. My sentencing was justified because I committed the acts. But I also agree that the sentencing structure and that the, all of the responsibilities afterwards and all the consequences that go with afterwards could be seen in a light of saying, okay, do I feel that this person really can change? Can I see this person as an individual and not a criminal? And if we could begin to look at individuals as who they are and not the label and the group that we want to associate with them, then we could probably have compassion on them and understand that the decision, the verdict that I'm doing today is going to affect them and generations to come forever. So it's generational change that's occurring. It's either a positive change in restoration and reconciliation, or it's a negative generational impact through incarceration. Nobody wins from incarceration. Change can't happen. I'm living proof of it. Gene's living proof of it. Nikki's living, the men in this program. But the reality is if we weren't here for this, then these people wouldn't have an opportunity. If I wasn't given the opportunity by officials in the prison system, who knows where I may be today?